I would say antiquated economic policies, more like an antiquated economic system. Because, of course, what's the... Basically, that the entire concept that was more or less... Someone screwed it around. You know, talked about, but not really confronted directly in that entire report on the Real News Network was, of course, capitalism itself. The word capitalism itself was not mentioned in the way it really needed to be mentioned. Because it's this entire system that treats the earth and the resources of the earth as limitless and it was imperative is profit making like at any expense like in turning that resources into commodities and those commodities into dead capital that's the basically what capitalism does that's what the system is about that's what drives the system that's what drives the global economy right now and to think that somehow that is compatible with ideas like, say, sustainability or like some, you know, sustainable relations, some sort of like harmony with the natural world, like it's just, it's ludicrous. I mean, there is no compatibility between those ethics, those ethics of just endless accumulation and endless profit and anything like environmental stewardship or environmental protection or, you know, sustainable agriculture or sustainable anything, really. You know, there's no... There's no comparison there. And, like, have a, have a look at here. Like, for those... If you really want to know why Marxism has such... Definitely has things to say about environmentalism. I mean, just listen to what Friedrich Engels, what he said in 1876. And, of course, Friedrich Engels... Uh, Karl Marx's collaborator throughout much of his life. And he says, Let us not flatter ourselves over much on account of our human conquest over nature. For each such conquest takes its revenge on us. At every step we are reminded that we by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over a foreign people, like someone standing outside of nature, but that we, with flesh, blood, and brain, belong to nature and exist in its, mi in its midst. So basically he's saying, we depend on nature. Human beings, no matter what our technology is like, no matter what our economic situation is like, no matter how much wealth we have, we're always going to be dependent on nature, on the, the, just the natural systems of the planet, like the biosphere, the, the water, the, um, the soil, the air. We're, we're all dependent on that. If we don't have that, we die. Doesn't matter how good we think we are. Or how untouchable we think we are. We're not immune. If the biosphere starts to really go, like, to really start to melt down. And of course, we can see that. We can see it's very, very clear with global warming. With global warming, we see this, you know, like, you know, well over 90. There's a massive consensus in the scientific community that this is happening. You know, the last decade was basically the warmest in recorded history. It was, you know, it's. And before that, the 90s were the, the warmest decade in, in uh, world history. We're seeing increased incidents of famine, incidents of, um, of dr you know, just incidents of drought, uh, increasingly powerful storms, um, extreme weather, rising sea levels, actually threatening the survival of certain island nations now. You know, like two years ago, virtually the entire grain crop in Russia burnt up. So severe was the um, the drought there. I mean, it's... Like, we're seeing this all around us. But it's the imperatives of the capitalist system that prevent meaningful action being taken. Because, like, it doesn't matter what these politicians want, or how good their intentions are. They're basically servants of a system, an economic system, whose aim, universal aim, is profit. You're just reaping the profit, just bringing it all in. And they're there to serve that profit motive. So even if they wanted to really make a deal on this in a place like Doha or Copenhagen or Kyoto, like, of course, like, you know, that was like 15 years ago now, their hands are tied. They're up against a brick wall. You know, and that's, that's really what is at the heart of the matter here. You know, so you have that, and like, you know, but it's more than that. It's a lot more than that. 
this this uh, this reason why Marxism is so important to understanding the current environmental crisis. Because Karl Marx himself said in 1844, in one of some of his earliest writings, in 1844, he said, "To man, nature is his direct means to life, and the material, the object, and the instrument of his life activity. Man lives on nature; nature is his body, from which he must remain in continuous intercourse if he is not to die." That man's physical and spiritual life is linked to nature means simply that nature is linked to itself, for man is part of nature and thus inseparable from it. So he was saying this, like, you know, even, you know, almost 40 years before Friedrich Engels made that quote, which I just quoted just before, uh, just before. I mean, it's, it's such an intimate part, this understanding is such an intimate part of Marxism. Like, from the earliest days of Marxism, and it really is the underpinning of Marxist idea of materialism, right? Because the whole idea that we are, the human beings, are reliant on nature and on the natural world and that we come out of that and we are dependent on it really is the underpinnings of like every economic system that has ever existed on this world. And if an economic system is unsustainable, it is because... It estranges human beings from nature, as capitalism certainly does. It, it, uh, t- capitalism treats nature as if, you know, we human beings are somehow standing outside of nature. We can do whatever we want to nature. We don't, we're not dependent on it. We're there to exploit. We're there to, like, we've, to conquer nature, not to live in harmony with it. You know, so it's like we're estranged from nature. And if we, as- we are estranged from nature, in Marxist terms, we are estranged from ourselves because human beings are natural beings. So if we try to act like we are somehow outside of nature, we will destroy ourselves, which is what we are kind of in the process of doing, given the situation that we face today with global warming and all the other problems that we see around the world, where the, um, the biosphere itself is just getting trashed by, um, by the, uh, the economic system that we, that we now have. Like, that's, that's really what's going on. And um, just to continue from that, really when it comes to how Marxism relates to environmentalism, Marxism really is the solution. It also offers solutions to these problems that we're facing. You know, let's not be all doom and gloom and think there's no way out. There is a way out. But I would respectfully say that that way out is not through, say, these, uh, these global summits that we have every, you know, every few years and they don't do anything because all those leaders who attend those summits are beholden to a capitalist system that, you know, as I said before, is dependent on endless accumulation, endless profiteering at the expense of nature. So I mean, you hear often these days that green is the new red, that somehow uh, green movements represent the new radicalism, the new way forward, the new way to um, the new m- way of left wing politics, and that uh, communism is, is somehow obsolete or passe. Um, needless to say, I would beg to differ. Um, that the idea that environmentalism is somehow a replacement for Marxism in activist circles is, needless to say, very, very silly, very, very misinformed. I would say the proposed solutions that, say, a organization like Greenpeace or like any of the other uh, many, many organizations that um, they claim to be fighting for, uh, for the environment today, the many of the solutions that they propose um, really amount to what Marx called, in the Communist Manifesto, this is a direct quote from the Communist Manifesto, castles in the air, castles in the air. Now, when Marx talked about castles in the air, used that phrase in the Communist Manifesto, he was talking about utopian socialist communities, which really were the hippie communes of their day. In like we're talking like the 1830s here. Um, really, this is when oftentimes very wealthy industrially, see, when they would, they would almost like they would... Um, or philanthropists, or whatever you want to call them, would just form these kind of utopian communities that existed kind of on their own, and um, and uh, more or less were there. I don't know what the founders really thought that maybe if they built these kind of communities, these where there was equality and uh, and all these these um, and uh, and you know people would live in in a different sort of uh, sort of uh, according to different standards and in uh, different economic forms, if they just built these kind of like uh, just self-contained communities that some of the rest of society would follow their lead or something like that. I mean, it's, of course, it it never happened that way. 
just like with hippie communes and then in the uh, in the 1960s, they, these places largely faded away. They didn't have any systemic change on or effect on society at all. That's why he said there were castles in the air. But you see this today when you have like permaculture or downshifting or the fix your sustainable living and in, in all the forms that that's uh, been articulated. They really all those things fail to cut to the heart of the matter. That the environmental crisis is a class problem caused by a specific class. The capitalist class, and caused by a class system that is based on exploitation and accumulation. You know, we cannot solve this problem, this environmental crisis that we face, without addressing the systemic problem that is capitalism and what it does to the world. And so I'm not seeing that analysis, that very, very Marxist analysis, from any of these environmental groups that are out there today and really, uh, like, you know, making a lot of noise. You know, it's, in many cases, communism, you know, Marxism, really possesses a solution in the sense that, you know, working class revolution is effectively what is necessary. You know, putting the economy in the hands of people whose aim is not profit, but the well-being of humanity. You know, it's not about endless accumulation. It's not about endless profiteering for the few. It's about the well-being of everyone. That's what underpins a socialist economy, or what's supposed to underpin a socialist economy. And it's very, very different from, say, the capitalist economy, which goes all around the world and just, like, takes and takes and takes and takes and takes and accumulates and accumulates and accumulates and just ends up trashing the place. So basically, revolution has taken on a new meaning here. You know, huge new meaning. Because effectively, the stakes could not be higher. We're facing an out-of-control global capitalist class bent on maximizing profits at any cost. So revolution now may literally be a matter of saving humanity from extinction. Serious. I would say revolution is the only way we're actually going to prevent a serious crisis. A potentially apocalyptic crisis in the environment. that's caused by capitalism. So really, if anything, this environmentalism and the kind of present crisis should not be causing people to turn away from Marxism or seeing it as somehow obsolete. It should be causing people to embrace Marxism and seeing that this is a way, Marxist analysis is a way of understanding the kind of crisis that we face now and what it is we need to do about it. That's absolutely huge. We need to understand that now.